So it's the 23rd of May 2009. Um, we're in Bodrum, Turkey, um, attending the fourth conference of the Property and Freedom Society. Um, on this occasion, um, I am, my name is Robert Grutzinger, um, and I am uh, interviewing Sean Gabb, the uh, director of the Libertarian Alliance um, of Great Britain. Um, because of the scandal involving expenses in um, the UK Parliament um, and um, all the background uh, concerning that on, from his point of view as um, what I perceive as an astute um, observer of British politics. So, Sean, give us your view of what has happened in the last... Is it two weeks now? Um, every day, uh, uh, a re revelation about um, expenses uh, that should not have been made um, on uh, um, tax, uh, the taxpayers' um, billing. Um, um, it's, uh, there's been talk of it being a historic event seeing, for example, that the Speaker has resigned for the first time um, before the end of the term, uh, for the first time in 300 years or so. Sean, what is your view? OK, we need to look at the background to this general situation. Just looking at the news reports in themselves makes for an entertaining scandal, but not for much else. Um, I think what we need to begin by understanding is that the British Parliament is the most theoretically supreme legislative body in the world. It is unrestrained by any written constitution. The, uh, British, the British Parliament could, if it so chose, um, declare that I was a woman. It could divorce me from my wife. It could repeal the Government of India Act that, that gave India independence and um, send out a new viceroy. He might not be received in New Delhi, but it would be good law in the British courts. The British Parliament could pass a law sentencing every red-headed man to have his right hand cut off, and this would have to be accepted and enforced by the courts. There are no limits to the power of the British Parliament. Um, or rather, the legal phrase is the Queen in Parliament. As long as a bill goes through the House of Commons, through the House of Lords, and is signed into law by the Queen, it cannot be questioned in any British court. Now, this means that any government which is accountable to Parliament um, might be in considerable difficulties. What has happened during the past few generations is that the executive has neutralised the authority of Parliament um, by filling it with people of very limited moral character, uh, very limited moral and intellectual character. The the um, the government is formed by the um, by the dominant party in the House of Commons. The Members elected um, to Parliament to represent that party are chosen by the party leaders, uh, and so the government uses its ability to choose candidates to make sure that Parliament is not filled with the kind of people who in the past made such trouble for the authorities. I'm thinking of the 17th, 18th, and even the 19th centuries. So, so that is part of the background. Mm -hmm. These people are of very low value as human beings. Now, the deal put to them is that they will rubber stamp whatever their party leaders put in front of them. They will not raise fundamental difficulties that, that endanger the stability of a government or, or the viability of its programme. In return for that, they will be allowed, indeed encouraged, to have as much sex as they want and to take as much money in bribes and in fraud as takes the fancy. They've been encouraged uh, to acts which in the rest of us would be punished as fraud or tax evasion or both. 
And when do you think ha did this start? Um, did this start um, consciously by some government, um, or was this some kind of gradual erosion of morals, which then the government thought, uh, or people in government realised that is quite a good thing from their point of view? What uh, and how? Also, when did it start to happen, and how did it happen? In your point of view, there is no defining moment before which we had a functioning parliamentary democracy and after which we hadn't. It, it is a gradual process. Um, you might say it began as far back as the 1880s when the modern party systems came into being. So not the modern parliamentary parties, that, that they predate this by quite a long period, but uh, the party structures as they emerged in the 1880s gave leaders the ability to select candidates. Now, now this, is so, this is a power that grew during the 20th century. Mm -hmm. It was um, the power of the executive over Parliament was greatly increased in 1911, partly by the fact that the House of Lords was neutered, and, and partly by the fact that for the first time members of the House of Commons were paid a salary. Before then, they had been unsalaried, mm -hmm. which meant that Parliament was effectively shut to ordinary people, or people without independent means. And of course, once you have people in positions of considerable potential authority without independent means, they will be tempted, um, they'll be tempted to take bribes. Yes. I'm not saying it started then, but that was a, a step towards it. That was loading the uh, problem, yes. or loading the gun, so to speak, yes. and, and, and now the trigger has, yes. has been, well, the trigger was pulled, and, and now it has, now we've discovered the smoking gun. Yes. <laughs> if you want a real villain, um, I would put forward Margaret Thatcher's name as a candidate. Um, she regarded the House of Commons with probably well-merited contempt. <laughs> and w what she did was to make sure that uh, only the right people would be selected as Conservative candidates, i.e. that um, the only people who would be selected f for the Conservative Party to stand in elections were, were the kind of people who would be trusted to, um, to vote for whatever measures Margaret Thatcher put before them. And then you had the rise of new Labour. Um, until the 1990s, Labour MPs were traditionally rather rebellious, uh, often rather free spirits, generally in the wrong respects, but they were persons of individuality. Mm -hmm. uh, with the rise of New Labour, uh, that was ruthlessly stamped out, and the Labour majority that came in in 1997 was made up very largely of two-legged sheep, uh, who, who were offered the deal and took it with both hands. Mm. You can have as much sex as you want with your researchers, your prostitutes, your rent boys, or anything else. You, you can take bribes, you can solicit for bribes, as indeed uh, several Labour peers were found to be doing a few weeks ago. Or you can simply pad out your expenses, change your second, ch change your second residence for your first residence, claim your parliamentary allowances, uh, and do things which, as I said, would in the rest of us be regarded as fraud or tax evasion. It's something that crept up on us, but now it is a solidly established part of the Constitution. Yeah. So now that they've um, all been found out, and uh, suddenly everyone um, is running around like a headless chicken, um, in Parliament at least, um, we've all suspected something like that. Uh, being go going on, uh, there was anecdotal evidence, um, but now it's all been drawn out in to the public. The question f uh, for any observer is why now, uh, and why um, by the D D Daily Telegraph or the Telegraph Group, um, which previously has not uh, been famous for attacking the establishment, whether left or right. Mm. Um, it seems that the left, or the, the Labour Party, of course, being in government, is, is harmed much more um, 
at the moment, and Cameron is on top of the uh, the uh, crisis as much as he can be. Um, so it seems, on the face of it, that it is um, an attempt by the Daily Telegraph to help uh, the Conservatives to power. Um, but at the same time, it is uh, very harmful of um, the uh, um, uh, the reputation of Parliament as such, and that is something that the Daily Telegraph is not famous for doing previously. Indeed. Um, the question of why the Daily Telegraph got hold of that uh, list of expenses uh, and then published them day after day is well worth asking. Uh, the most obvious answer is that it is the function of the media in a parliamentary democracy, or it is the function of the media in a liberal democracy, uh, to, to hunt out and expose wrongdoing in high places. Mm. But, um, well, the British media hasn't been very good at doing that, and the Daily Telegraph has never been particularly good at doing that. Uh, the idea that this is fearless investigative journalism with nothing but the public interest at heart is... Um, uh, probably one of the more bizarre conspiracy theories. The other conspiracy theories are much more interesting. Um, let's, go through the, let's go through the most obvious conspiracy theories. One is that um, this helps. This helps the career of Boris Johnson. He is uh, Britain's most senior politician who is not also a member of the House of Commons. He's the Mayor of London. He resigned from Parliament last year after being elected Mayor of London. He will hold that office until, I believe, 2012, after which he may stand again, or he may decide to return to Parliament. Uh, he, he, he's known that he would like to return to Parliament, indeed that he would like to become a Conservative Prime Minister. Now, um, to, see this, to see these revelations as assisting in the struggle between the parties it is um, unrealistic. It really is like um, trying to win a trench battle with an atom bomb. Mm. This is something that has damaged Labour politicians very badly, but it's also damaged a number of Conservative politicians. And it seems to have been a fairly random process. Um, indeed, among the Liberal Democrats, one of the people who's been damaged by the revelations is somebody who has been campaigning for many years for greater transparency uh, of members' expenses. So um, it's difficult to say that any particular group of politicians uh, ha has um, been worse hit than any other. Hmm. Except that, as you said, Labour's in power, so they've been, uh, they've been raking the majority of the, um, uh, of the corrupt gains. But... Um, Boris Johnson is known to be a long-term friend of Benedict Brogan, the assistant editor of the Daily Telegraph, who has supervised the publication of these, um, of these revelations. Uh, Boris Johnson, indeed, used to be a journalist employed by the Daily Telegraph. Now, it might assist his own ambitions if every other Conservative politician were to some extent to be tainted w with these corruption scandals. <coughs> Boris Johnson is out of Parliament, uh, and so he has no expenses to claim at the moment. Uh, however, he was a Member of Parliament between 2001 and, 20, uh, and 2008, mm. and the Daily Telegraph has not published anything about his own expenses. It may be that he was perfectly honest in his uh, claiming of expenses, but it might be interesting to ask why his name is on one of those lists. Indeed. Um, another conspiracy theory is um, the timing um, a few weeks before the European election where um, uh, the, the polls are uh, um, in a way that the UKIP is on the rise, even the BNP is on the rise, Labour is uh, uh, on a downward trend and the other two established parties as aren't go doing too well um, that they uh, the telegraph or whoever is behind this revelation uh, would like to cause as much damage um, t in this election as possible because this election is not 
um, not relevant in, di in a direct way to British politics, but uh, is, of course, um, um, the result uh, would put enough fear into the established um, parties uh, to do th drastic th things that uh, I, I don't know what, but... Uh, uh, so what uh, what do you think of that uh, possibility? It is possible that there is a European dimension to this. Uh, I am entirely ignorant of who and why. Who gave these details uh, to be published and why? I don't know. I I've given one guess as to who did it. Let mm. me give now um, a guess as to why it was given over, though um, I, don't, I don't presume to join up the who and the why. That, that it may be an entirely inconsistent theory, but uh, let, let's imagine this. Some, the person who handed over these details to the Telegraph, or the person who um, initiated the publication of these details, perhaps is not in favour of European integration, perhaps he would like Britain to leave the European Union. Look at it this way. The Lisbon Treaty will only come into force once it has been signed into law in every one of the 27 member states. David Cameron, uh, the Conservative leader, has issued a very ambiguous promise. He has said, if the Lisbon Treaty has not been ratified when we come into office, we will hold a referendum on it in this country and we will recommend a no vote. Every time anyone has asked... Mr. Cameron, what would you do if you came into office after the Lisbon Treaty had been ratified? He won't answer that question. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in the normal run of things, uh, there would be a general election about a year from today, uh, next May, mm -hmm. May 2009. Mm -hmm. no, sorry, May 2010. Yes. Sorry, as ever, I'm rather behind the time. <laughs> um, there would need to be an election by May 2010. The, the Czech president, Václav Klaus, is refusing to sign the Lisbon Treaty into law uh, in his country. Um, he is under great pressure to sign it. I believe the Polish president has also refused to sign it. Uh, the Irish rejected the um, treaty in a referendum earlier this year, and they may accept it in a second referendum later this year. Now... now President Klaus has said that he will keep the issue open until after the elections in Britain. But the question in terms of Czech politics and the pressures that can be put on the Czech president by the Germans, the French and other pro-integration governments is how long can he keep the issue open? Now, if the Brown government were to be severely destabilised in Britain... Um, if Gordon Brown were forced to go to the public, forced to go to the country in, shall we say, September, October, or, or even for an emergency election in July, it is highly likely that the Conservatives would win. Um, the, the only question at the moment is how big would the Conservative majority be? And so, the sooner the election, the more likely it is that the Lisbon Treaty will be destroyed. Uh, and so those people who say this is a European plot to, um, to, to taint Parliament, this is a European plot to undermine British institutions, I don't see the benefit in that. Whereas this might well be an anti-European conspiracy, mm -hmm. but by whom and for what reason, those are questions I can't at the moment answer. Okay, um... This crisis, being of historic dimensions, wouldn't would uh, would normally be a chance for now looking at constitutional dimensions here um, for the Queen to step in and throw out the Prime Minister. Not not that way, but she would ask him to leave more or less, ask him to hand in his resignation. Yes, uh, I would suspect that. Uh, um, a clever um, palace staff could leak this to the public and uh, from that moment on um, uh, Gordon Brown would have no choice anymore. The pu public is so furious um, 
against uh, about him and about uh, Parliament, uh, they, he would have no choice. He would have to leave. Um, you, uh, I expect you don't expect this to happen. Why is it not happening? Um, it would be a chance for the Queen to assert a little bit more power again and to recreate a new balance or um, ch a new kind of checks and balances in British politics. Has she not got the stamina to do or the, the the courage to do this? Has um, has she not got the historic um, view of this? Uh, or what? Why is this not happening? I was until a few. I was until a few years ago a, a very strong supporter of the monarchy. Um, the argument I put forward was that uh, the Queen was the ultimate safety valve in the Constitution. Um, it is regrettable that from time to time governments are elected which promise to do very bad things, but uh, the rules of the game mean that uh, the, the Queen should not stand in the way of a government which has a, a democratic mandate. But I did argue that um, there, might be, there might be circumstances in which a government would behave despotically. In that case, the Queen would step in and, um, a, and restore the Constitution. The problem is that the present Queen has now been on the throne since 1952. And so far as I can tell, she has been very happy to sign every piece of paper ever put before her, except perhaps personal checks. <laughs> she signed into law, uh, she signed the European Communities Act in 1972, um, I think without a protest. Sh she uh, signed the Civil Contingencies Act into law in 2005. Which gives Could you just explain that? So okay. Yes, the Civil Contingencies Act uh, allows government ministers to declare a state of emergency in which they can suspend virtually any law they please, they can imprison people without trial, they can take property without, uh, without compensation. It, it allows the government to, to declare a police state. Mm -hmm. uh, and it can also, I believe, put off elections. Now, now this is... Um, it's rather like, is it Article 48 in the Weimar Constitution? No, the, 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 the enabling, the state of emergency that Hitler used. Oh, anyone, I don't know yes, the exact number. Yes, anyone who uses the Nazis as an, exa as an example is deemed to have lost the argument. But, <laughs> um, the Civil Contingencies Act is an extraordinarily dangerous um, weapon in the hands of a bad government. And the Queen signed that into law as well. And the Queen signed the Nice Treaty on European Integration into law without a protest. She was deluged with letters uh, begging her not to sign the Lisbon Treaty, n not to sign the Act um, incorporating the Lisbon Treaty into British law. Uh, and here she had a very good case for calling the Prime Minister in and saying, I, I won't um, sign this act. I'm sorry, I won't sign this bill into law. And, and the reason she was given was that um, four years ago, every party leader, every main party leader in Britain, promised that before the European Constitution um, was ratified by the British government, there would be a referendum. The European Constitution was then repackaged as the Treaty of Lisbon, exactly the same content, different form. Uh, the government thereby claiming that uh, it's not the constitution, therefore we don't need to worry about the referendum. Um, the Conservatives tried to force a referendum, uh, but they didn't have enough votes in Parliament. Now, it would, have been, it would have been perfectly acceptable for the Queen to say to the Prime Minister, call a referendum, or I will not sign this because you have a contract with the British people, and I'm here to make sure that you keep your contract with the British people. And again, she just signed the, um, she, she signed the bill uh, incorporating the treaty into British law. She has done absolutely nothing by way of doing her duty. And so for the Queen now, now that she is 82 or 83, uh, suddenly, after 50 seven years of doing nothing 
to stand up and start behaving like uh, Queen Victoria or William the Fourth or George the Third is a little much to expect. Mm. I don't think this came from the palace. If it did, um, I have seriously underestimated the monarchy. No. Um, last question, basically. Uh, what do you think is the likely short-term outcome of this crisis um, uh, regarding the rules of expenses? What uh, What is going to happen um, in that sense? And also what's going to happen after the next election, whenever it is? Well, as far as the expenses go, there will be a great parade of clean hands by the uh, senior politicians, and new rules will be announced which uh, may make uh, expenses more transparent. It, it may compel members to publish their expenses online. Um, but after a few years, it will become apparent that uh, these people are defrauding the taxpayers in other ways. In other ways that I can't yet imagine, but um, the deal is still on the table. Do as you're told, and here's the reward. Uh, and um, the, a reward will somehow be found. The short-term effect on the European elections, it may damage the Conservative vote, because all of the main parties have suffered in mm. these scandals. Many people will not bother voting at all. Others will vote for UKIP or, or the BNP. Um, I'm no good at predicting the outcome of elections. I generally get them wrong. But before the scandal broke, I was willing to think that uh, there might be one BNP member in the European Parliament. Now it might be four or five. Before the scandal broke, I was rather worried that UKIP the, part, the United Kingdom Independence Party, uh, which wants to leave the European Union, uh, the party for which I vote, I was rather worried that UKIP would lose many of the 12 seats at one of the last European elections. I think UKIP will keep those seats. It may even gain a few. In the longer term, the Conservatives will probably recover faster than Labour, and we are now looking, we now seem to be looking at a general election result, which um, may be a landslide for the Conservatives, or, or, or may be um, a record landslide. The, the Conservatives may win the sort of victory that um, outdoes what Tony Blair managed in 1997. It may even outdo the great Liberal victory of 1906, where the leader of the Conservative Party actually lost his seat. And that would not necessarily be good for liberty and democracy in Britain as a strong, a super strong governing party has no, with no, out any strong opposition, can do whatever it, it likes. That's uh, true. And I just don't regard the Conservatives as significantly better than Labour. They are better than Labour. I'd be foolish not to agree with that proposition, but they will not be significantly better. Uh, that being said, if we had a Conservative government next time with a majority of 45 or 60 uh, and a strong, effective Labour opposition, um, every time those of us in the wider Conservative movement said, hang on, you can't do that, that's awful. Conservative governments aren't supposed to do that sort of thing. You'd have the government supporters coming up and saying, well, you know, you've got to support us, because if it's not us, it'll be Labour. And you wouldn't want Labour back, would you? Mm -hmm. Now, it looks as though that argument will not be open. If the Labour Party suffers a catastrophic defeat at the next election, and the Conservatives have a supermajority, yes, they can do whatever they like in legislative terms, but they'll also have a very unwieldy majority, a, a majority which will have sucked in uh, large numbers of members who, um, who are not persons of no consequence. It will lead to uh, factionalism within the Conservative movement, uh, within the Conservative Party, and it also means that those of us in the wider Conservative movement can attack bad Conservative laws with much more confidence. It will not be like in the 90s, where every time we did something to undermine the major government, the last Conservative government, 
We always knew the back we, of our minds. Sorry, we meaning the liberal, uh, the libertarian alliance, the libertarian or alliance, or or any, any kind of other fringe uh, organisation on the fringe of the Conservative Party. Well, or? I should define what I mean by the wider Conservative movement. Um, the wider Conservative movement includes organisations like the Libertarian Alliance, uh, the United Kingdom Independence Party. Uh, the, the, the Bruges Group, all the other anti-European um, organisations, the Taxpayers Alliance, No to ID Cards, all of these organisations which are not directly affiliated to the Conservative Party, but which are part of the wider movement. Um, if there is no Labour opposition, we shall with much greater confidence be able to attack the next Conservative government and give these people 45 seats as a majority, give them 200 seats as a majority, they will still do some very bad things. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you.